Good uh, evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's uh, University of Melbourne and ICT for Life Sciences presentation. I'm Stefan Harra from IBM Research Australia. The ICT for Life Sciences Forum's goal is to encourage knowledge sharing and collaboration between researchers working at the interface of life sciences computing, engineering, and mathematics, and to inform the wider community about the exciting developments taking place at this interface in Melbourne and around the world. The ICT for Life Sciences Forum is very pleased this evening to have as its guest speaker, someone who is undertaking fascinating research in understanding how nature manufactures strong and durable materials and how we might actually learn from nature to allow us to design new materials that can be applied to biological systems. Not to mention new materials that have environmental advantages. After graduating with a BSc a degree from the University of Melbourne, Tiff Falsch earned her PhD degree in theoretical chemistry from the University of Cambridge. She then joined the Department of Materials, University of Oxford, as a postdoctoral researcher in the Materials Modeling Laboratory. In 2002, she joined the faculty of the University of Warwick, UK, as a joint appointment in the Department of Chemistry and the Center for Scientific Computing. Her research interests focus on computational modeling, the interface between biomolecules, inorganic surfaces, using molecular dynamic simulations. In 2012, Tiffany was awarded a Vesky Fellowship that brought her back to Melbourne to take up a position of Associate Professor in Bio and Nanotechnology at the Institute of Frontier Materials at Deakin University. Please welcome Professor Tiffany Walsh to deliver her presentation, Can We Be Smarter Than Coccolithophore? Taking Lessons in Advanced Materials from Nature. Um, so thank you for that very kind introduction. And also thank you very much to Luan for convening this uh, seminar series. Um, it's a real privilege and an honor to be able to, uh, to give a presentation in this forum. So, um, uh, as, as you've already heard, our talk, the talk tonight is going to be about biomineralization and uh, a little bit about some of the work that we do in modeling uh, at the molecular level some of these uh, phenomena that come about because of the interface between biomolecules and inorganic materials or minerals. So, I'm going to start with the coca lithosphere, which is this beautiful structure, only a couple of microns big, very intricate. It is the, the protective casing of a single-celled organism uh, that uh, floats about in the sea. This casing is secreted by the animal, <coughs> or by the organism, and it's, uh, this casing is made from a material called calcium carbonate. Uh, the, the calcium carbonate is a crystal, right? So it's a, a mineral in a crystal structure and in its crystalline form you can find many polymorphs which are different ways of arranging the atoms in a, in a crystalline uh, uh, formation. Uh, and the particular polymorph that this uh, casing is made out of is called calcite. Calcite is the uh, most thermodynamically favourable form of calcium carbonate uh, at, at, say, room temperature and pressure. But you can see that this is a very intricate, uh, detailed uh, artefact. In fact, it, this image doesn't really do uh, this, this um, coccolithosphere any justice because not only is this made from a single material, this is calcium carbonate with some water and, as you'll find out later on, a little bit of something called, uh, uh, of things called biomolecules as well. But uh, each of these components, so these things here are called hubcaps, each one of these plates. And in each of these spokes, for example, these are single crystal pieces of calcium carbonate. So this, uh, this is a truly remarkable piece of architecture. 
And uh, if you were able to zoom in and look at, say, one of these spokes, you would see further and more intricate organisation of these sort of single crystalline pieces that interlock together. Now, all of this is created by the organism at, room temp or at lower than room temperature and ambient pressure in, in water, in the sea. These, uh, these little guys are really important, actually. They have a very big role in our carbon cycle. So they are able to sequester carbon, so they lock it up, and they are responsible for the formation of the oil beds, uh, the chalk oil, uh, oil reservoirs in the North Sea. So it's from millions of these guys falling to the bottom of the sea over time being crushed, uh, and uh, you know, many hundreds of thousands of years later, you've got oil. So they have a very important role in that sense. But <coughs> coccolithospheres are, uh, are very, um, very interesting to us because they give us inspiration. Because right now we don't know how to make one of these spheres in the lab, even though it's made from a small number of ingredients. This is pretty much chalk, water and some biomolecule. It's uh, a thing that has not yet been accomplished in the laboratory. But a single-celled organism knows how to do it. So that's uh, the basis of my talk. Before I start talking more about biomineralization, I just wanted to give you an idea of where we've come as a civilization in being able to manipulate materials. And I'm going to start with something that we really know a lot about, and that's steel. So we've been working with steel for thousands of years, and even even, you know, because, even because of that, we still have got a lot to learn. So research in steel is still highly dynamic and active, and there are a lot of open questions. And some of the best brains in this country are working on steel. And there's a couple of ways, really, that how we kind of manipulate it for different applications. That is to change its composition, its chemical composition, or to be able to change what we call its microstructure. So that's its structure at the at the micron scale level. And it's, uh, it's really important because we use different kinds of steels for different applications on the basis of this treatment that can give you different composition and different microstructure. So for example, the type of steel that you would find uh, in, a, in, a, in a surgical blade, in a scalpel, is very different to the kind of steel that you find in a piano wire. Actually, piano wires are one of the most demanding applications of steel uh, because the wires are placed under enormous tension and they have to have a very special microstructure. This is something called perlite and we're looking at its structure on the micron level. You can see these lamellae and that's integral to be able to, to confer this property of, uh, of the, um, the, the steel in, a, in, a, in piano wire. But the thing is, we know how, you know, we know something about how to work steel and how to process it to get different properties. But it's a really hot, dangerous, messy, and frankly, scary business. And I don't know how many of you have poked your head in to a foundry, but I just wanted to show you just how noisy it is. So this is how we make materials. I'm going to restart in a minute, but I can't bellow over the top of it. So what you've been watching is an enormous block of, mo of hot metal that's about 1,200 degrees Celsius. And you would have seen it rocketing down some kind of conveyor belt with guys just standing by kind of watching it. Uh, and they're working this really hot, frankly dangerous piece of material. Let me just take it forward a bit. So this is what we're doing to it. So as you can see, I think I'll just move on from that, I think we've seen enough, 
It's energy intensive, it's dangerous, and it's very labour intensive. It requires a lot of people standing around doing things and, and really uh, exposing themselves to, to substantial danger and a lot of heat and noise. So it's a messy, dirty, horrible business actually, making things as a general rule. On the other hand, the cocker lithosphere is making this incredible structure at room temperature and pressure without any heating up to 1200 degrees, without any bashing, without any uh, loud noises. It's made from very few ingredients, but the, one of the key ingredients, it's perhaps one of the smallest ones, is the biomolecule. Now the agency of the biomolecules in creating this object are really pivotal. Because if you just put calcium, and, calcium carbonate into water and you recrystallise it out, this is what you get. Right? This is a very nice specimen of, of uh, calcite. You would get a rhombohedral form of crystal. You do not get this. So there's something to learn about how we could be inspired by uh, how nature actually does this. And it's not just confined to cocker lithospheres. Of course, there's all kinds of different uh, creations that you can find in the, in the sea. Uh, these are some from uh, some work from Steve Mann, who's a, a, a leading figure in the area of biomineralisation. Uh, not all of these are made from calcite. We also have, but typically, if you're looking at uh, biomineralised structures from the sea, you're looking at minerals that are made out of calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, or silica, because these are the available uh, mineral-forming ions that you can find in the sea. As you can see, there's a lot of variation there. But like the coccolithia sphere, they're all quite large. So the scale bars here are 10 millimetres. They're quite large objects. So not quite nanoscaled. What I want, wanted to show you here is that this concept of, the, of biomolecules and minerals getting together to, to form, uh, say, materials in nature, works right down to the nanoscale. These images that I'm showing you here from a very influential uh, uh, review from someone known as uh, Mehmet from Mehmet Sarakaya. Uh, and these are mostly scanning electron micrographs of high performance natural materials. So some of these are being shown here in this panel because of their superior mechanical properties. The first one I want to focus on up here is a close up image of what we know as mother of pearl, otherwise known as nacre. So this is what you find on the inside of abalone shells. Now, uh, it's been, this image has been coloured to kind of help uh, the interpretation. But what you can see are these layers. The green discs, hopefully you can see them as green, are calcium carbonate. They're calcium carbonate tablets. And you can see them being formed, being a, sort of arranged here in a stack. This orange la uh, layer is the, is the biomolecule, the kind of glue that's holding it all together. But one of the key things you'll find actually in all of these examples is that the biomolecules are controlling the nucleation of the inorganic material, the growth of that inorganic material into some kind of nanostructured shape, and finally the organisation or the assembly of these nanostructured inorganic materials into some kind of functional arrangement. So here we have a biomolecule that's controlling the formation of this calcium carbonate tablet. And a few slides ago I told you that calcium carbonate in its most stable form is called calcite. This, the biomolecules in this, in this material actually stabilise a form of calcium carbonate that you do not get in the lab at room temperature and pressure. So the form here is called aragonite. So actually, aragonite shouldn't be here at room temperature and pressure. Yet the biomolecules in this, in this, in this uh, material stabilise the formation of that particular polymorph. So you've got a mineral that shouldn't be there, and it's being arranged, it's, being, it's formed into disks, which is another thing that the biomolecules are uh, delivering. And then the final thing is that they're being arranged into these columnar stacks. And this, is, uh, uh, this overall picture confers the superior mechanical properties of this material. So it's actually high crack resistance. The image I'm showing you down here on the bottom left 
is a close-up image of the enamel in your teeth. It's called dentin. It's basically a form of hydroxyapatite, so this is a phosphate-based mineral. And you can see here these nano-structured, or nano-sized crystals of the mineral. Again, the, the biomolecule is controlling the nucleation and growth, the shape of these. So now you don't get these disks, but you're getting these kind of uh, almost like, a, I guess, elongated uh, football kind of shapes. And these are, again, being woven together in a 3D arrangement. Again, conferring superior mechanical properties that you'd expect from, from your teeth. These other two materials that I'm showing you don't have mechanical properties, they have other properties. The one at the top right here is actually a, a close-up inside the, a, um, a thing known as a magnetotactic bacteria cell. So these uh, uh, magnetotactic bacteria are able to sense the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, they can do so because inside the cells you have this linear array of magnetic nanoparticles. So these are made from iron oxide and these iron oxide nanoparticles are being arranged into, the, into this sort of linear organisation. Again, the, the participation of the biomolecules at the interface with this iron oxide is a, is a key kind of uh, element. And finally, what I'm showing you down here is a material with superior optical properties. So this uh, is, a, is an image of a silica spicule. These spicules are found in sponges at the bottom of the sea. And uh, actually, they're, they're grown to harvest the light uh, in the, at the bottom of the sea, actually for a, for a symbiotic or organism that lives in the sponge. Uh, but the idea here is that these are perfect light collectors. So these are like the best fibre optic cables in the world and they're made at room temperature or uh, lower than room temperature and ambient, ambient pressure under the sea. So <clears throat> the biomolecules that I've mentioned here that control the nucleation growth and the assembly of these inorganic materials to deliver a functional high performance composite also show great selectivity, not only over the type of material they bind to, but also, in some cases, which facet of that material they can bind to. And I'll, if you're not sure what a facet is, I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. And then finally, also the polymorph. So we talk, I've, always me, I've already mentioned the two different forms of calcium carbonate, calcite and arag aragonite. And uh, this selectivity over those two would be a form of uh, polymorph selection. So the idea here is that we don't necessarily want to learn how all this happens in nature because I want to go ahead and make teeth enamel or I want to make shells. But I want to learn something about how this happens to get some inspiration about how to make new materials with different functionalities or maybe make materials that could be done or could be fabricated more cheaply, say, uh, with, in, in more benign conditions than the ones I showed you in the foundry. So what, where have we got to in terms of being able to accomplish what nature can do? Here I'm showing you an example of where people have got to in terms of making the nanostructured material. So I said the biomolecules are responsible for nucleating and growing in the crystals of inorganic material. And people can do this in the lab. Actually, people can make nanoparticles of widely different compositions, shapes and sizes. So people can make spheres, rods, propeller blades, stars, witches' hats, dumbbells, snowmen, pretty much any shape you like. And in terms of the actual chemical composition, there, is a lot of, uh, uh, there have been a lot of advances in being able to gain very fine control over that, so to have functionally graded uh, nanoparticles in terms of their chemical composition. So there's really been a, a lot that uh, uh, has been done in terms of being able to make those. But where we really have a problem is what we do with them afterwards. So we can make all sorts of different nanoparticles, different compositions, different shapes. But unlike nature, we're not very good at organising these into some kind of useful or functional array. So <clears throat> if we want to do this in a lab, it typically can take a very high-tech setup that you can't exactly just roll out or scale up. So you either have to use focus ion beams or you, you use some kind of physical manipulation of a, of a surface and deposit your nanoparticles onto it and get them to line up into rows. 
or you can use optical tweezers and just kind of like almost manually manipulate uh, the positions of these nanoparticles, but you don't really want to have to do that. That's not very, it's not very helpful. It makes a lot of pretty pictures and nice papers, but it's not very helpful. Um, so one thing that we're really inspired by, but, but we would like to actually get a lot more diversity from, is an approach that has come out of Chad Merkin's lab. What I'm showing you here, and if you've done inorganic chemistry in your life, you might look at these and think, well, they just look like those crystal structures that I learned about when I was in first year. Um, but these aren't atoms. These are actually nanoparticles. So what these guys have managed to do is actually make super lattices, things that look like crystal structures, but not from atoms, but rather from entire nanoparticles instead of atoms. They uh, managed to accomplish this by a, uh, a technique where they fuse DNA onto the nanoparticles, and they can only do this with gold. So the technology is there to conjugate a DNA molecule onto gold, and you can do that with a controlled density uh, of, of graft and by manipulating the actual DNA strands that you have conjugated onto the gold surface and by manipulating the conditions, you can get these different crystal, crystal structures of these super lattices. But it's not very diverse. So right now you can only do it with gold. <coughs> you can't extend this to the other kinds of materials that I, uh, that I mentioned uh, previously and you certainly can't do it with a mixture of materials. Uh, this is just to tell you a bit more about what the, the potential um, benefits are if we could just gain some insights into how nature makes materials. So um, one thing I'm showing you up here at the top is a, is a schematic of the mother of pearl that I was just telling you about. So here's a, a, a nice abalone shell from Broome, I think. And here is inside is, an, is a scanometric electron micrograph of these aragonite tablets I was telling you about in this columnar stacks. But actually what's really going on in there is this complex multi-layered sort of structure. So you have your calcium carbonate tablet on the top. You have a thing called a chitin layer down the bottom. And all of you know what chitin is, even if you don't think so. It's uh, the stuff you'll, you, uh, that's in the, the exoskeletons of things like prawns and lobsters. So any kind of prawn or lobster shell is mostly made out of chitin. And then we have a protein layer in between. It's that protein layer that's not only sticking onto the chitin, but promoting the growth of aragonite and its formation into these tablets. So if we can just understand something about how that works, we could be uh, deploying that into a whole bunch of different uh, applications. So, uh, for example, learning how to better tailor surfaces to get, uh, I think, improved clinical outcomes for biomedical implants um, from something you know, as immediate as that through to actually sort of found, uh, providing a foundation for further technological developments. In this case, being able to sort of facilitate the, the, fabra, the um, creation of metamaterials. So metamaterials are just materials made from say, the arrangement of nanoparticles I was just talking to you about that, uh, with, with Chad Merkin's work, that we could say, for example, use for waveguides, so for actually bending light or twisting it and turning it. This could also be used for medical diagnostics. What I'm showing you here on the right is a really beautiful example. This is from Wei Shen's group, it's out at Monash. They got the Eureka Prize for this, where they have biofunctionalized paper. So now they're absorbing biomolecules in a controllable way onto cellulose and using this as a disposable uh, blood testing uh, diagnostic. And this one might come as a bit of a surprise, right? So these are kind of obvious technological things where an interface between biological matter and uh, synthetic material might make sense. But actually, there's a very important role that these interfaces play in deepening our cultural understanding of where we all come from, which I'll tell you a bit more in a, in a little bit. So, I just want to give you two examples. One is like an obvious example of, of the kinds of things we just talked about in a bit more depth, and then one that's less obvious. That's about uh, our, so the cultural understanding. So, the first one is uh, uh, pretty much based on a, a grant that I'm a co-investor, a co-principal uh, investigator on with the United States Air Force. So, they're interested in waveguides, and they want us to be able to deliver on the following things. Uh, they want us to be able to 
organise these nanoparticles into predictable assemblies, into predictable arrays. And then they um, not only want us to be able to organise them a whole bunch of different ways, but they want us to be able to reconfigure that, or that assembly at the sort of flick of a switch. In this case, they, they want us to be able to reorganise these assemblies if we, do, if we deliver some kind of remote stimulus, so if we uh, shine light on them or if we heat them up, something like that. So what we've been doing is, is deploying uh, a kind of recognition between biomolecules and inorganic surfaces. In this case, it's a peptide onto, in this case, it's a gold surface to try and reach that goal. So we're in the very first sort of early days of that. But the idea is that we can design a biomolecule that will recognise one particular material, so it could be gold. We have another peptide or biomolecule on the other end of this molecule, so it's like a three-layer construct, that will recognise a different material, so that could be another noble metal. For example, we're working on silver, or it could be quartz, it could be cadmium selenide, whatever you like, that will only stick to this end of the molecule so that you don't have the, this nanoparticle sticking to this end and vice versa. And then some kind of, uh, mole, some kind of uh, motif in the middle that is going to respond to this external stimulus. So for example, if we're going to shine light, we can use azobenzenes, which, can, which uh, trigger a, a, a very pronounced sort of conformational change when you uh, shine, the, shine the light on them or switch the light off. And the reason we want to do this, or the reason this has uh, implications for waveguides, is that uh, this ability to be able to bend light, for example, is really, it, it hinges on the ability to very precisely position these nanoparticles in a 3D array. And furthermore, they can be very distance dependent, so very sensitive on the distance between the nanoparticles. And I hope I've already convinced you that it's actually quite tough to be able to do that if you're using uh, other techniques. To be able to use biomolecules might be a way to achieve this. So this is what we're, we're working towards so that we can do things like bend light around corners or make it twist around. This is the second example I wanted to tell you about, which is a rather less obvious one. It's one that I'm only, uh, I'm sort of involved with. It's part of a, a thing we have called a program grant in the UK. And one of my collaborators in that grant is Matthew Collins at the University of York. So while people like me are trying to make new waveguides, uh, Matthew is trying to actually date some of the earliest sites of modern humans. And this is a really tough thing to do because a carbon-14 dating doesn't go back that far. So you're unable to actually date some of the sites where really there are very, very controversial and sort of uh, critical hypotheses about what happened with very early humans. So they use a thing, it's really quite neat, they call it an egg timer. And it comes about because as human beings we've been eating eggs for a long time. And whenever, wherever there are humans there are eggs, right, there are eggshells in the, in the middens. And uh, the thing about eggshells is we're coming back again to calcium carbonate, actually to uh, calcite, in ostrich eggs because their site is here. It's in South Africa, this is an aerial shot. It's called Pinnacle Point Caves. It's one of the most pivotal areas for early, human, uh, uh, for early humans. And from the ostrich, oh sorry, here, yeah, from the ostrich egg shells, they can look inside the calcium carbonate where they know they're gonna find decomposed proteins because pro some of the proteins actually sit inside the crystal. And they decompose in a very uh, in a reasonably well understood sense in terms of time. And the time taken for that degradation takes a lot longer or can span a, a lot longer range than carbon-14 dating. So they are trying to calibrate and investigate this interface between decomposing biomolecules known as peptides inside these ostrich eggs to tell them to, to, to use this to actually date these sites, which is a, a really remarkable achievement. So this not only helps us to you know, resolve these really complex stories about where we all really came from, uh, uh, but you know, it can tell us a lot about, about us as a, as a culture. So it's, it's not all uh, just about new technologies. 
So what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation is really uh, uh, um, the, the area that's involved with uh, peptides and inorganic surfaces or inorganic substrates and how we can use these and harness these to make new things. So <clears throat> for those of you who don't know what a peptide is, it's a bit like a charm bracelet. You've got these links in your bracelet and then these kind of charms that dangle off the sides, except really in terms of in, in a molecular level, these are different molecular structures that will have different chemistries. The nice thing about peptides is that they have a lot of things going for them if we want to make them do things. So they're real workhorses. There are 20 different types of these what we call side groups. I've just I've given them different colours. Uh, and so if we wanted to string together 12 of these repeat units and choose from our 20 different beads, we have 20 to the 12 different sequences we can make. So you can appreciate how much diversity there is just in that set alone. They have a lot of chemical variety, these, different, these 20 different beads. They can, they've been shown to recognise different materials. And uh, they're, very, they're already known for their assembly properties. So they can, um, and when they're part of a composite, we know that they can confer additional properties, for example, mechanical properties, so that you would find in things like keratins. And uh, last but not least, they're adaptable, so that you, if you expose them to a stimulus, you can make them change. You can make them change their conformation or what they prefer to bind to. So they're really adaptable and tunable. And these are all great things if you want to start using this as a toolkit for making new materials. So this is going to be our, our biomolecule glue that's going to stick different materials together. Just a bit about how people have actually managed to identify and show that peptides really can distinguish between different uh, materials, materials of different chemical compositions. They use a, a, a technique known as biopanning where they actually use our, our foes, our sworn foes, viruses, uh, in a good way. So they use these viruses to display the peptide at the end of the virus, and they can manipulate the, the, ge the genetic makeup of the, of the virus. So each of these peptides on each virus can be displaying a different sequence. So that's a different, uh, a different sequence just means, you know, maybe these go colours going in a different order. And so you can get a diversity of about a billion, a billion sequences in this kind of library of viruses. You expose them to different materials, you wash off the ones that don't stick, you keep the ones that do, and maybe go through that cycle a couple of times and then back out what that peptide sequence would be from the virus genome. And from that you can figure out what sequences stick best to a given material. There are problems with this because a billion sequences isn't enough. You really need about 10 to the 15 to be exhaustive. But uh, you can certainly go a long way. And right now, <clears throat> one thing that's really sort of coming on in this area is being able to use informatics to predict even better sequences that you could determine from, from experiment. And some, there's some very nice, uh, clear examples of that in the literature. But this thing I said about sequence, it really does matter if you want to explore binding selectivity. So it's easy enough to find a sequence that will stick to a whole bunch of different materials, uh, say titania or silica, gold, what have you. But what you really want is to find a sequence that's going to stick to, say, gold, but then not stick to calcium carbonate, something that shows this selectivity. Here what I'm showing you are two sequences. So each of these letters stands for one of those beads that I was talking about on the previous slide. So these can conceivably have, each one of these has conceivably has a different chemistry on the side chain. Now both of these sequences have the same number, or the same type of each residue. So you can see this H here. So there's two H's here, there's two H's here. But so it's the same content, it's just being put forward in a different order. Yet this sequence here on the left will bind exclusively to silica and it will not bind to gallium arsenide. You mix up the sequence and it will bind to both. So it completely abolishes the selectivity. So what this tells us is that this interface, this recognition between the biomolecule and the peptide is not just about, well, you know, I've got two histidines and, uh, and a proline and that's what's working. 
it doesn't matter at all if you can mix up that content and get a very different uh, binding affinity. Now, the thing about this is that when you mix up these sequences, you're pretty much changing their structure, their three-dimensional structure, what you can do. And so there's a very complex interplay between the order in which this content is presented, the 3D shape that molecule is going to assume, and therefore it's, it's binding to that particular inorganic surface. And that's something that uh, our, my own team and many groups around the world are trying to get to the bottom of. Now peptides, I just wanted to show you this to, to convince you that they really can be selective and they can be used in a multi-materials fabrication. So in this case, they're using a gold binder peptide and a platinum binder peptide, and also one that will bind to, to silica. And you can see here from the images where they've conjugated a, a, a quantum dot that shows up as red in these images, that if they stick the quantum dot to their gold binder, and they, stick, they basically expose it to this surface, that you can only see the peptide stuck onto the gold part of the, of the multi-material surface. So the background here is silica, you've got a platinum pad here and a, a gold pad here, and it's only sticking onto the gold pad. On this case, you can see, maybe it's not coming out so well, but there really is something sticking here to the platinum pad. I think it's just a bit faint. It's probably the least convincing of them all. Uh, and here you've got a difference between gold and silica, and you can see that this quartz binding or the silica binding peptide is binding to the silica but not to the gold. So there is definite selectivity there, and you can be using this to make complex 3D arrangements. It's also been shown quite recently that you can use these peptides to do another one of the jobs that I mentioned earlier, and that is to control the shape of a nanoparticle. So in this case, it's a, very, it's a beautiful example where they're able to use peptides to control the growth of platinum nanocrystals, where uh, if they can stabilise like the 100 surface, they're making cubes, and if they stabilise the 111 surface, which are uh, these ones here, these triangles here, they can make tetrahedra. But uh, what they really don't, what they're really yet to get to the bottom of is why it is that you need these two sequences to get these two different nanoparticle shapes. So this has been discovered, well, not by accident, but uh, they, there's certainly no understanding of how you go from here backwards. Right, so why, what is it about this sequence that makes it so special? And here's where molecular modelling can actually be used to help elucidate some of those reasons in very close partnership with experiment. So one experimental technique that's really important <coughs> is, are, the, are the ones that tell you about structure. Because I just told you a few slides ago, right, that uh, the sequence changes the 3D structure and that can change the way that this molecule sticks onto a surface. Some of the techniques we have can tell us something, but actually the inference can be really difficult. So there's something known as circular dichroism spectroscopy which can tell you something about the secondary structure, so something about the shape of these molecules. But it, it can be very challenging to back out exactly what, that, what the, uh, the answers mean. There's solid state NMR, which actually works very well, but the problem is that the sample that you prepare is not like the sample you're really trying to investigate. So what you're really interested in is this peptide in solution on the surface. What solid state NMR is, is, is something that really doesn't have a lot of water in it. It's a bit of a problem. Um, but recently, some teams have been able to carry out and interpret what's known as um, NMR, which just tells you, basically, if you're not familiar with NMR, it just tells you about, uh, it tells you something about the structure of these molecules. So we can determine something about the structure when they're absorbed onto the inorganic material but it can only be carried out for limited conditions, so we can't just be applying it everywhere in, in all cases, unfortunately. But for the cases where it is possible to carry out the experiments, this is a perfect test ground for molecular modelling because it enables us to be able to confront our structural predictions with what is being measured. So this is where um, molecular modelling can really play a role, and it's something that in my team, we spend a long time uh, thinking about and trying to do. 
So we specialise in advanced computer modelling at the molecular level to predict the properties and behaviours of, of complex biomolecular systems in general. But in this case, we are really interested in predicting the structure of these molecules when they're stuck on the surface and uh, therefore what their properties are. For example, their binding affinity or their selectivity. And also what it is about these particular interactions that confer this property so that we can go, uh, hopefully take this information and use it to design new sequences that are gonna do different things or should be able to multitask, for example. So that's what we're trying to do. So what's really important for us when we do this type of modeling is that we need to be able to describe the interactions between all of the atoms in our system. Uh, and that uh, could be quite tricky. So there, if there's a million, you know, if there's millions of atoms, for example, in the system, we really rely on supercomputing facilities. And in this instance, it's absolutely critical to have access to something like the VLSCI facility. So for us, this is a really key component of our research. In fact, we couldn't get done the things we do if we didn't have access to it. So we need to be able to, in some way, write down and evaluate all the interactions between all the atoms in our system. And we do this in a very simplified way, because if we've got a million atoms, we can't be doing it too, uh, in a too detailed a way. It would just take too long. So we use what might look like rather Mickey Mouse types of analytic functions to describe these interactions. But the whole idea here is we're not trying to be ultra, uh, I guess, accurate. We're just trying to capture the guts of the physics and the chemistry that's going to dictate the behaviour of these systems. So I've told you that we need to be able to describe all the interactions between the atoms. And at this point, I just wanted to give you a bit more of a sense about the complexity of the, of the kinds of things that we do. Without getting into any of the details, of, of what we actually do. But I just want you to consider the case where you've got a particular arrangement of your atoms. And I've already told you we need to be able to evaluate the, uh, the sort of interaction energy between each of these atoms. And when we do that and we sum them all up, we have a, a function. So our energy is a function of the positions of our atoms. Now, if we have many atoms in our system, then our function is many dimensional. It's not like a, a three dimensional function like I'm showing you here. It could be like a 12,000 dimensional function. Obviously, we can't visualize that. So we need a way to be able to explore this multi dimensional function without recourse to thinking about, well, how can we sort of find each and every nook and cranny of it? And that's a real challenge to us. So, in some ways, it's a bit like being in the Swiss Alps. And for us, all the important parts of this landscape, this multi-dimensional function, are the parts that are really low-lying. So if it's like, if you're in Switzerland and you're up in the mountains, you're always looking for the lakes and the valleys. And that's, uh, that's the analogy we really sort of do follow here. So this can be quite tricky if you're up here in the ranges and you're trying to find the, the lowest lakes or the lowest valleys. Uh, on, a, say, a, a, a multi-dimensional function, that can be a tricky thing to do. And again, that's why it's essential for us to be able to use the computing power at the VLSCI. What I'm showing you here in this central panel is just like a 3D representation of this kind of energy function. And because they are a bit, because of the analogy with things like mountains and, and lakes, we tend to call them energy landscapes. And you can see here that we can take slices through this landscape. So if I take a, a slice, if I was able to get a knife and just cut it through here and then turn that cut on its side, I would have something that looks like this, where these little dips here are the parts of the landscape that we're most interested in. We need to be able to find those using our molecular simulations. So really the guts of what we do are two things we need to describe the interactions between all the atoms in our system. And because we're bringing together two very dissimilar materials, a sort of a synthetic min or mineral material and a biological material, that can be not a straightforward task. And also, we need to be able to wander about on this landscape and find all the low energy structures. So each one of these dips corresponds to a structure that is likely to be observed in experiment. 
So it's really critical that we find those. So that's really what our job boils down to. Through applying these simulations, these are the types of things that we're doing. We're trying to investigate peptides binding onto materials of different chemical compositions, so what we call material selectivity. Why does one peptide want to stick to gold and not silver? The second thing we're investigating is a thing called facet selectivity, which is why one particular face of the same chemical composition could be more preferable for, for a peptide than another. And this last one is polymorph selectivity. So for example, why would a peptide want to stick to aragonite over calcite? They're two different polymorphs of the same material. And we do this in partnership with experiment, and that's really important for us. Because we use computational modelling, I think, uh, uh, you know, as someone who does computational modelling will tell you, it's easy to generate data. You can always generate data. The hard thing is generating data that means something and that makes sense. And so that's why being able to confront our findings with experiment is really important because otherwise we can just dream up anything but it needs to be ground truthed with actual observations in the lab. So here's just an example of work we've got going on. I just wanted to show you three examples before I wrap up. Uh, so this is uh, one example of material selectivity. This is part of our Air Force grant, where we're trying to understand why a peptide would prefer silver over gold. The thing is they're both noble metals. They have a very similar lattice constant, which means the spacing between the atoms is very similar. So you can't just say, well, it's because, you know, some kind of lattice matching argument that doesn't really work. Um, they have very slight, no, they have slightly different chemistries and that silver's more reactive. Um, and what we're trying to do is predict the structures of these, of these peptides on the surface and then uh, relate this to the binding affinities that are being measured in the lab. Uh, and so what these dots are telling you is that the hotter the dot, basically the stronger the, the connection between it and the, the, between the peptide and the surface. And you can see that this kind of map of the hot spots of interaction is very different between the two materials. So some parts of the molecule really prefer sticking to gold, but some parts prefer sticking to silver. And it's basically being able to unplat those threads so that we can dream up um, peptide sequences that have a better selectivity over these two materials. I just wanted to tell you about facet selectivity, and I was a bit concerned. I don't know if, uh, if everyone in the audience knows what I mean when I say facet. So I've just made a little image here to, for a very simple crystal structure. So this is just uh, a close pack crystal. And I've drew, drawn two planes here in pink. And this would just be if I was able to take a knife and cut it through the 3D crystal structure and then look at what surface gets presented. On the left, what I'm showing you is the 111 facet where I take a cut through that sort of that 111 plane there. And on the right, what I'm showing you is the 100 facet, which uh, I'm taking a, a cut through the 100 plane. And they show a very different arrangement of the atoms. So this is for gold. And here you can see a sort of hexagonal arrangement of the atoms. And here it's more like a square arrangement. And you might think, well, what, really, what difference does this really make? because it's quite subtle, but it can make a really big difference actually in terms of what peptide sequences want to stick onto these things. So you don't even have to change the chemical composition. You can make a change as subtle as this and see remarkable differences. So this is some work that um, uh, we're just about getting wrapped up where we're able to calculate the binding strength of these peptides onto different facets of the gold surface and see what we see is a distinct difference in the binding energy and also be able to relate that back to the structures. Uh, so you can see here some of these, the structures on the surface where things don't bind so well is because half the molecules just sort of waving, waving off and not very engaged with the surface. Whereas in the other, in the other cases, it sticks on a lot more uh, evenly and, uh, and readily. So it's being able to um, uh, identify those parts of the, of the molecule that stick well onto various facets that can enable us to design new sequences. And just lastly, I'm going to come back to Mother of Pearl. So this is my last example, where we're trying to understand um, why it is that one of the key proteins in Mother of Pearl that stabilises the aragonite 
It can carry out its job in the, in the mother of pearl because it recognises only one of two possible forms of chitin. So chitin is the stuff that prawn shells and lobster shells, crayfish shells are made out of. And there's a layer of it inside this, this sort of structure of the mother of pearl. And it's a, a particular polymorph of chitin called beta chitin. And what we're trying to understand now is why is it that these molecules only stick onto beta chitin? What is it about them? And uh, actually, I think our modelling is, is revealing the origins of this selectivity. So here's a picture that one of my students, Aaron, made up of, the, of these molecules sticking onto the chitin surface. And one thing we found that for beta chitin over alpha, alpha chitin is there's a profound difference in that when biomolecules interact with beta chitin, some of them can actually penetrate inside the crystal. <coughs> Getting back to that eggshell story I was telling you about. Whereas if we look at this on alpha chitin, they can't do this, they can't work their way in. Uh, and this is what we're beginning to think is actually the origins of this selectivity in this case. Now this is all very nice, it tells you about mother of pearl and that's a, it's a nice story, but there are more po possibly more beneficial impacts from this. For example, the transmission of the malaria parasite undergoes a key stage where it has to pass through uh, a part of the mosquito that's like the, the, almost like the gut lining, in, in our analogy. Uh, and it's basically made out of beta chitin. And what the parasite does is secrete a bunch of enzymes that facilitate its passage through this beta chitin. So possibly there's a way through understanding the penetration of these molecules through beta chitin that we could perhaps access uh, some clues about how to, to stop malaria transmission at that point. So it's not, it's not all about mother of pearl. <laughs> it just feels like that. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the end of my uh, talk. I just want to finish up with the acknowledgements. So uh, I just wanted to, to acknowledge some of the, the computing facilities, obviously the VLSEI being a very big part of what we do. Um, but we do use other, or we have used other facilities in the past. Um, there's a bunch of experimentalists that we work very closely with that we're really in their debt because they actually keep us honest. And then there's uh, a whole group of very talented people, both past and present, who I've had the real privilege of working with in my team, who are the ones who do all the hard work. And critically, here are all the organisations that support my research. So I'll wrap up with that and I'll thank you very much for your attention. This evening is a special one for the ICT for Life Sciences Forum. In October 2008, uh, the forum uh, celebrated its five years. It has now delivered remarkable achievements. And please allow me to highlight these for you. The ICT has held 34 events similar to the one that we have just experienced, uh, of which 18 have been uh, with speakers with uh, speakers from overseas in 18 of these events. Um, the ICT has hosted five Graham Clark orations and four other events ranging from tribute dinners and a farewell dinner for the previous governor of Victoria. In all, over 14,600 people have attended the ICT for Life Sciences Forum events over its last five years. That's quite remarkable. As a forum sponsor, IBM has benefited from the forum, bringing leading researchers from Melbourne and from across the world to share their knowledge and ideas. And in this way, the forum has certainly achieved its goal of knowledge sharing and keeping our community informed about the exciting developments taking place here and in the world. We also find the dinner for sponsors and the speaker, which takes place after these events, a rewarding opportunity to network and form new relationships, all of which is of benefit to our growing team of researchers. So on behalf of the forum sponsors and those who have attended the forum's events, may I wish it a happy fifth birthday. We look forward to many more such events, great speakers, and sharing the many exciting ideas and breakthroughs that are in progress. Please join me in congratulating the ICT for Life Census Forum on this important milestone.
It is through the generosity of the ICT for Life Sciences Forum that we are able to have the opportunity to hear leaders in their field share their work and ideas with us. I would like to thank the forum sponsors for their support. And these sponsors are Philips Ormond Fitzpatrick, the Melbourne Convention Bureau, the Bionics Institute, the Melbourne School of Engineering, the VLSCI, the RMIT University, Monash University, the Bio21 Cluster, Melbourne Health, St. Vincent's Hospital, the Center for Neural Engineering, the Victoria Research Lab NICTA, CSIRO, ANSTO, the Bionic Vision Australia, and last but not least, IBM. Please join me again in showing our appreciation for Professor Tiffany Walsh for her excellent presentation and the insights that she has given us. Thank you very much and good night.